Hi everyone, welcome to the first lecture of immunology. Now this lecture is designed to be an introductory lesson to give an overview of the basic elements of the human immune system. Then we will briefly talk about the basic features and components of both the innate and acquired or adaptive immunity. The later lectures will cover each topic in much greater detail. Here are the lecture objectives. We'll look at an overview of the immunology and the immune system, and then we'll go look at some of the basic components of the innate immune system, and as well as the acquired immunity. And we'll describe the interaction between the innate and acquired immunity over the time course of an infection. And lastly, we'll wrap up with a compare and contrast of the basic differences of the innate and acquired immunity. We will begin with some of the very basic definitions. What is immunology? Now, by definition, it is the study of mechanisms that the body uses to defend itself from invasion by other organisms. So in this course, you learn about a lot of the mechanisms or cellular mechanism of how the body to defend against of other invading organisms. Now, the key to this whole immunology is how uh, the body recognizes self from non-self. What is an invading organism? What is a self molecule? All right. So this recognition is done by the immune system. So what is immune system? Now, immune system is a very complex of cells, tissues, organs, and substance that defend or protect the body against infection from outside invaders. At the same time, to protecting the body's own cells. Now, what does that mean? It means to protect from autoimmune responses and diseases, and it also requires an immune mechanism to regulate the differences between self and non-self. Now, what are the players in this immune system? The main players are leukocytes, or commonly known as white blood cells. They carry both innate and adaptive immune responses. So where do we get the white blood cells? Now, white blood cells is a very general term. Now here we look at a graph that is hematopoiesis. Now it happens within the bone marrow. Now we have hematopoiesis stem cells and then branch out into different lineage. And when we talk about White blood cells, we are really talking about cells that are branching from the common lymphoid progenitor and cells that branch from the common myeloid progenitor. Coming off from the lymphoid progenitor, we have cells including B cells, T cells, and NK cells. Now notice that the B cells and T cells are part of the adaptive or acquired immune system. And on the other hand, the NK cell actually can be grouped into the innate immune cells, uh, including neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, dendritic cells, macrophages, and mast cells. These are considered our innate immune cells, which is the first line of defense. Here is a table that uh, briefly summarizes the key differences of recognition mechanisms between innate and adaptive immunity. Later on, we'll see a graph, but here is just a table first. Notice that innate immunity, they are very fast. They also recognize a limited number of uh, molecules or antigens, and their responses are usually doesn't change, usually stay the same, they're constant. And on the other hand, in the adaptive immunity, the responses are slow, but they can vary their uh, recognitions and can be highly selective toward a specific antigens or molecules. And their responses usually improve over time and over second exposures. What they're common is that there are some type of effector mechanisms, meaning some of the cellular mechanisms to destroy the pathogens. So when we are talking about immunity, it is all about defending against infections. So how do infections occur? We are talking about two players, meaning the host and the pathogen. Host can be any living organisms where pathogens can produce and survive. 
and for example, both domestic wild animals and humans can be the host. And because this is a human immunology course, we will focus on humans as our host. In terms of pathogens, they are biological entities with potential to cause diseases after invading the host. Uh, we have parasite, protozoal, fungi, uh, pro prokaryotes such as bacteria, viruses, and prions. Now, for our discussion in this course, we will mostly focus on defend against bacteria and viruses. Now, what they are common about all these pathogens is that they carry non-self molecules that might be recognized by the host immune system. I say might be because there are some cases they can dodge the immune system and we'll explore those in our later lectures. To begin with our innate immune system discussion, let's begin with the very first first line, meaning the barriers against infection. Here are some of the major breakdown of the innate immune components. First, we have physical barriers, such as mechanical, chemical, and biological, or microbiological. Second would be inflammations, third, complement system, and effector cells. Now, in this lecture, we're going to have an overview of all of these key major players in the innate immunity. In later lectures, we'll look at specific topics of inflammation, complement systems, and effector cells. In terms of physical barriers, the most simplest, most obvious physical barriers would be the epithelial surface that separates the body from its external environment, and it would be our skin. Okay, we can see that. Uh, technically, we can call them external epithelia. The protection is due to keratinized stratum cornea, which is the outermost layer of dead skin. All right, these epithelial cells underneath the dead skin are tightly joined as well to prevent invasions of organism, microorganisms. Other than skins, another type of uh, epithelial surface actually is internal epithelia, meaning the mucosal lining that are lining our nasal uh, passages and as well as our gastrointestinal surfaces. Let's look at the first categories of our epithelial barriers, mechanical. The mechanical, uh, other than the physical layers, it also includes the flow of fluid or mucus, and it all depends on where they are located. And for example, in the skin, on the skin we have sweat, on the GI we have saliva, respiratory system we have our mucus, and in our urogenital uh, area we have a urine, and eyes we would have tears. They all provide a flow, constant flow, and that can help to uh, eliminate the pathogens that are adhered to those areas. Second type of barrier that are on the epithelials are chemicals, such as enzymes, low pH, and antimicrobial peptides, such as defensins. They also spread out on different locations of the body. For example, in skin, we have sebum, which usually contains some antimicrobial peptides as well. GI, we have protease, uh, such, which is an enzyme that can help digest uh, some of the protein components in the invading organisms. Uh, respiratory system and eyes, uh, we have lysozymes, which is also provide a um, very basic functions to uh, destroy bacteria. And in terms of urogenital area, we have the acidity from the urine. Those acidity from the urine can provide a lower pH that is unfavorable for a pathogen to grow. Let's look at some selected specific locations. And here we have the mucus and cilia of the respiratory tract. In the respiratory mucosal surface, we have a lot of mucus which contain mucins. Now, what is in the mucins? It's such as those acetic glycoproteins, and it provides a lower pH and prevents microbium, uh, microorganisms to stick to the surface. And 
second thing that is uh, preventing the microorganisms to stick is cilia. Now, the cilia in the lung mucosa provide a type of movement we call it retrograde movement. Now, the retrograde seems to be a difficult term to understand, but think of it just as sweeping motions. The idea is to sweep the uh, mucus toward phrenix, and those mucus are usually often trapped with all these pathogens. After uh, being moved to the phrenix, uh, the next step is to cough it up to eliminate it that way. Now, other than those, it also contains surfactant protein A and D. These can coat the pathogen and decrease their ability to adhere to our respiratory tract and also enhances phagocytosis process. In tears and saliva, it contains lysozymes. Now, these lysozymes are positively charged or so-called cationic. Now, it can interact with anionic or negatively charged bacterial cell wall. And when we have a positive and negative interactions, we can hydrolyze the linkage in the cell wall and therefore breaking open the protective layer of the bacteria and it will later lyse, lyse uh, in the process. Other than lysozymes, they also contain some positively charged proteins. Uh, we call them alpha defensins and beta defensins. In the stomach, we have hydrochloric acid. It is secreted by parietal cells lining the stomach, which is the body part of the stomach. That provides a low pH that may be able to uh, kill or uh, keep the pathogen from growing. Killing means bactericidal, and keep the bacteria uh, from growing would be bacteriostatic. Now notice that not all bacteria would be killed by these low pH, and there are some exceptions. In addition to hydrochloric acid, we have pepsin. Pepsin, which is a gastric protease, an active form of pepsinogen molecules, which can help digest some of the protein structures that are coating the bacteria or other pathogens. Now, in the intestine, they have alpha beta defensins. In the stomach, they also have defensins as well. Now, notice that uh, these defensins are some of the really basic cationic proteins that can help defend the body from uh, pathogens and specifically more so with the bacteria. So far, we have looked at the mechanical and chemical barriers that are associated with the epithelial. Now we are looking at the microbiological factors that are helping to defend us. Now it would be normal flora. All of the major locations that contain normal flora would be our skin, on top of our skin, our GI tract, respiratory tract, urogenital, and eyes. Now notice, that is there a common theme about these major locations? Skin, GI, respiratory, and urogenital, eyes, what are their comments? They all face outside. Now I know our GI is inside our body, but think about it. It is a surface that is uh, have constant contact with the outside environment. What is outside? The thing that we eat. We are bringing outside thing into our GI tract. Anyhow, now so the examples of normal flowers would be these uh, Lactobacillus acidophilus. Now these uh, acidophilus can produce uh, lactic acids, which is uh, unfavorable conditions for candida albicans. So it's to can pre prevent them from overgrowth. So there, here is a, an example where uh, normal flora bacteria can protect the body from yeast infection. Now, it is believed that the yogurt products consumptions can help to reestablish some of these normal flora. For someone who has been sick or has been taking a lot of antibiotics, which is uh, killing all of the beneficial normal flora in the GI tract. 
The innate immune system by itself is often sufficient to deal with most pathogens and other microbes in the environment. Oftentimes, you would never notice a potential infection at the physiological level because it is cleared so fast by mechanisms of the innate immunity. Now, they can be found in both invertebrates and vertebrates, but many uh, invertebrates, such as insects, only survive with these innate mechanisms. They consider the first internal responses to fight off infections caused by uh, breakage of physical barriers. Oftentimes, we're talking about cuts, wounds, scraps, or when we uh, touch our eyes or nose or mouth, things that can enter through this mucosal pathway. And one of the key hallmark or keystone of the innate immunity is inflammation. Here, let's take a first look of inflammation. We will discuss inflammation in much greater detail in later lectures. Now, here we are talking about acute inflammation, which is a state of heat, pain, redness, and swelling. And it depends upon macrophage activities. And usually what happens is that they are the responder that are triggering the events for inflammation. And once the macrophage encounters something such as bacteria, it begins secreting chemicals. We call them cytokines. Cytokines are directly related to the features related to inflammation. First, it can directly cause pain by stimulating our pain receptors. It can also lead to vasodilation, and on the surface, will it will look red, and also feel warm. And it will also increase the vascular permeability, causing swelling. Now, the purpose is that for it, the uh, capillary to be a little bit leaky so that the macrophages and other immune cells can go to the uh, area to fight off some of those infections. It can also have a function called chemotaxis, which is a process that to recruit neutrophils and monostimulate monocytes to differentiate into terminal macrophages. We'll discuss a lot of the inflammation steps and mechanisms in much greater details in later lectures. Again, here is just a broad overview. But like I said in the last slide, the cytokines can cause vasodilations, which is uh, responsible to increase and also slow local blood flows. Now, why do we want to slow down the blood flow? So that the uh, leukocytes or the white blood cells can uh, migrate and stay at the site of infection. Uh, also increases capillary permeabilities. Now, this leakage will help the cells to get to these peripheral tissues. Again, these uh, changes in physiological um, state will cause tissue swelling and all these leakage also promotes the migrations of the white cells. Other key components of the innate immune system will be the complement system and its effector cells. Their function is to recognize and destroy pathogens. Complement, in a couple words, is mark or flag the pathogens. And effector cells is to engulf and degrade pathogens. Now we will discuss all these systems in much greater details in later lectures. Here is a very interesting picture. There is a piece of bread, and there is some type of maybe butter on it, and there is a person trying to eat this piece of bread. Now you will find out what this means later. Remember we talked about uh, recognition mechanisms of the innate immune systems or innate immune cells are, are fixed, so they are a little bit limited. Uh, however, they can still recognize uh, some range of pathogen-associated molecules, and these we call them pathogen-associated molecular patterns that they can be found on pathogens such as bacteria. Here we have an abbreviated term called PAMPs. Now these structures are usually highly conserved in a microbial species, such as polysaccharides, glycoprotein, phospholipids, that can be found on a pathogen. Now these immune cells, for example, our macrophages, carries an array of receptors 
that can recognize these PAMPs and these receptors. We call them pathogen recognition receptors. And in later lectures, when we discuss the details of macrophages, we will look at these specific receptors in greater detail. And to briefly talk about the complement-mediated responses, we are looking at two major mechanisms. Number one being having the complement proteins that can recognize and bind to PAMPs. And when they bind to them, we call them opsonizations. And after opsonizations, there are also other complement proteins that can form pores and lyse the bacteria. And the second mechanism of the complement is to have macrophages to engulf complement-coated pathogens. And pathogens are being broken down by phagocytosis. Now, here again, there's the same picture with a piece of bread and some butter. And I often described an analogy. Here, imagine the piece of bread is a bacteria. And the butters is the complement protein. Once you put some uh, butters on a piece of bread, probably it will taste better and it helps to get uh, eaten. And here we have a person, imagine that is the macrophage. They, they like to eat complement coated pathogens. Uh, now, here is a very quick brief overview of the complement system. And in later lectures, we'll go dive into the detailed mechanism of the complement system. So here, let's have a quick overview of the adaptive immunity. The adaptive immunity, you can see that I oftentimes interchange with another term called acquired immunity. The key thing about this system is specific, specific, and it's only found in vertebrates. And you wonder why I keep drawing bunnies as a vertebrate because uh, this year is the year of rabbit. <laughs> anyway, I also keep two rabbits at home. Um, anyhow, uh, this adaptive immunity can protect against a single pathogen at a time, meaning that they form very highly specific uh, antibodies or T cells that can recognize a one pathogen at a time. And when you encounter a different pathogen, it will get activated again to recognize another pathogen. Now notice that I use the term activated again in all these. Now this implies that this response is slow. It takes days to weeks to generate a new receptor or new antibody to recognize a new pathogen. Now the good thing is that these immunity do carry uh, memories so that the next time if you see the same pathogen, the response would be very quick and strong. Now, in terms of the cellular components of the adaptive immunity, in a broad sense, we can call them B cells and T cells. They are specialized wiper cells, and they have surface receptors that can recognize a particular ligand or antigens. Now, these specific part of an antigen, we call it an epitope. Again, we will have much more details on the adaptive immunity in later lectures. Here we're looking at some of the very funny looking drawings. Now we will look at those later on. But just have a very quick overview of the B cells and T cells. But the technical terms for these cells should be B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. For B lymphocytes, their major function is to detect antigens and they can also present antigens to other cells, such as the T cells. They can produce antibodies for a specific pathogen and the release of cellular chemicals that will also promote further immune responses. They can also activate T cells. Now, in terms of T cells, they can detect antigens on antigen presenting cells or B cells. So here you see some of the interactions between B cells and T cells. And T cells, once they get activated, they can differentiate into killer T cells, which are cytotoxics that can kill virus infected cells or helper T cells, which can further activate more B cells. Now, overall, these B cells and T cells will 
eventually differentiate into memory B cells and memory T cells and carry uh, immunological memories for a specific antigens. Here we are looking at some of the timeline comparing the two different uh, responses, the adaptive and the innate response. Now the upper graph here is that shows you when there is an infection. Usually or oftentimes the innate response kicks in very quickly and trying to fight off the infections. But however, the adaptive response usually comes in later on and oftentimes happens when the innate response is inadequate to fight off the infectious load. Now notice that infectious load goes up, meaning for example, there's increasing the amount of bacteria or viruses that the innate response is unable to, come, uh, to fight off. And we have our adaptive response start slowed and then come uh, come into a very powerful and more specific response. That's the first encounter. Now when we have recurrent infection of the same pathogens, the second exposure would usually oftentimes trigger adaptive immune response very quickly along with the uh, innate response. And in this case, the infectious load would go down relatively quicker compared to the first encounter. So I spent a lot of time to draw these cells. Uh, they're very cartoonish, but I hope this cartoonish drawing can help you uh, very quickly to recognize cells that are in the innate and adaptive immunity. Now for the innate immunity, we have uh, some of the physical barriers, our skins, tight junctions, as well as cells such as phagocytes, NK cells, dendritic cells, complement proteins, and their response are usually within hours after infection. On the adaptive immunity side, the major cellular players, we have B cells and T cells, and B cells can differentiate into plasma cells and secrete antibodies, and T cells can differentiate into uh, helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, as well as other subtypes of T cells, and overall we call them effector T cells. Now notice that there is a crosstalk between the innate and adaptive immunity, and usually happens with antigen presenting. For example, dendritic cells can present antigen to the T cell. I know this is a lot of information in one slide, don't worry, in our next lecture we'll look at all these individual cells in much much more uh, greater details. Now here is a graph to illustrate primary versus secondary responses. Now oftentimes the primary immune response are slow and weaker, and for example, when you receive a first dose of the vaccine, usually the response are much weaker. However, if you receive a second dose of the same vaccine, these reactions will be much more rapid and powerful as illustrated in this graph. Another key thing about the differences between innate and adaptive immunity is the memory. Innate immune system treat each encounters with a particular microinvader as they were meeting it for the first time. And here we have a picture. Let's look at a movie clip. Well, that was an old movie. I don't know if you have ever watched it. Anyhow, in terms of adaptive immunity or adaptive systems, they have a very uh, good memory and they can also modify and adapt this response to subsequent encounters with the same stimulus. And you wonder, why is there a picture of a cop pulling uh, a person from speeding? Well, you should remember your speeding violations, right? Well, you have a memory and you gain memory from that encounter. And the next time when you see cops in a far away uh, pace and you would modify your response and slow down. This is an example of adaptive immune system memory you adapt.
Now, just to summarize a lot of the things that we talked about between the similarity and differences of the innate and adaptive, here is the similarity summary. Well, there are not that many common things about the both branches. We can say they both use white blood cells to carry immune system response, and they all use cytokines for cell signaling. On the other hand, their differences are much more. Here is a nice table summary. Now, I don't think you need to specifically memorize this table because it is only a summary of everything that we've just talked about in the last 30 minutes. That is the end of the first lecture. I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.